this Sunday, of course, we're going to talk about the importance of groups. And it was great that uh, God spoke to our mayor because that's exactly what we're talking about. Robert Putnam's book, Bowling Alone, um, I'm very aware of that. And it's the situation. And the church has the cure for that. The church has the solution, unlike any organization in the world. The church, the solution is in the church. And I want to invite you to read and you can follow on the screen with me, if you will. Luke chapter 5. Now, this is a story where Jesus is just starting his ministry, just getting going here. And what he's doing, he doesn't have his small group with him yet. He is going to have his small group. He's already a teacher. People already like to listen to him. But he's starting this out, and a crowd has come around, and he's looking for a way to not be pushed into the lake where he says on a beach. He's looking for a way to not be pushed into the water, so he sees some boats. And this is where we kind of pick up in the story. Here it is. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Hey, put out into deeper water and let down the nets for a catch. Now, if you've ever owned a boat, you know what a pain this is. It's not easy owning a boat and taking it out onto the water. As much time as your family is enjoying being towed by your boat and you're having fun, that's the amount of time you're going to spend cleaning your boat when you get home. And everybody's off watching TV, playing video games. Where's dad? Dad's outside with a hose right? Tightening things up, scrubbing things down. The last thing you want to hear is for a little kid to come, hey, let's go back out, dad. <laughs> no, I've done. I've cleaned this thing up. This is where we're at with Jesus and Simon Peter. Jesus has this great idea for Simon. He's just come in. He has washed the nets. He is done for the day. He's been up all night. He wants nothing more than to go home and lay down and be left alone. And here Jesus has a fantastic idea. Let's do it all over again right now. Simon countered, answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. Now, this is just letting Jesus know. Look it. You just got here, buddy. We have been here all night. We have worked hard. Now, you don't know this, but the fish are nowhere near here. We've caught nothing. This is our situation. Have you ever had somebody come and suggest something that you've done a million times, and you know the way it works, and they come in and say, why don't we do this? And you're just like, oh, Lord, help me not to slap them. I mean, that's a hold down, hold down. You know what I mean? And, and this is the situation. Here is Simon listening to Jesus, have these great ideas. But then it's kind of like his mother, right? And, and here Jesus says, well, Simon, um, <laughs> Simon is thinking, well, Jesus, I, I'm going to do this for a couple reasons. Number one, there's a bunch of people looking at me, and they'll probably complain, and my mother will probably be mad at me if I don't do what you told me to do. And the other one is, I'm going to do this just to show you how wrong you are. So you learn to ask the guy who's been out all night, the guy who's put in the hard work, who's done everything. Learn to ask them and trust their information before you come in and make all these new ideas. So we're going to do this your way, but I hope this turns as a lesson to you, Mr. Jesus. <laughs> but because you say so, <laughs> I will let down the nets that I've just washed, that I spent the entire night working with. Yes, we're going to do this all over again. I won't be sleeping today, I see. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. What happened? What on? What? I've been out all night and I've caught nothing. I've done this. I'm a professional. This is my work. I come. And this guy, who I don't think has ever been fishing a day in his life, he comes and he tells me to do this. And all of a sudden, I get the catch of my life. Well, I hope the TV cameras were here. This should be on the evening news. This is amazing. What on earth is going on here? I've never seen anything like this. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were the sons, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. You know, there comes a moment in your life when something so unreal happens, so unpredictable, so unexpected, that you're sitting there saying, 
I have not had the same thing happen to me that always happens. Something different happened this time, and it kind of jars you. It kind of it, it distracts you a little bit, gets you off track, and it causes you to think, maybe something else is operating here. Maybe something else is going on now. And all of a sudden, this is where Simon finds himself. He's thinking, I think God is in this. I think God is doing something because this is too strange. And he thinks about his own life and he says, oh, not me, not me. This is nice that God did this, but you know what? He needs to go find people who are more like God. He needs to go out. And this is where Simon Peter is. And Jesus says to Simon, Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything and followed him. And then a strange moment when Jesus sees this guy who's saying, hey, I'm, I don't deserve to be anywhere near you. I, I have nothing to do with this. I'm just standing here. All of a sudden, you come in and interrupt my routine, and you do something amazing that I'm sure I, that, that's a one-time event for me. I'll tell you what. I'll go my way. You go your way, and, and I'll never forget this, and I'm sure you'll forget me, and, and that'll be the way it should be. And Jesus says, oh, no, no, Simon. No, no, I've got more plans than that, buddy. <laughs> here, you follow me, and you're going to be a part of my group, my small group now. And they go on for from there and, and they call some other guys they call some others and pretty soon Jesus has a group of people around him that he is helping just like he did Simon to show them what God can do in your life when you do things God's way when you let God lead you the change that can happen and we confront this and we reject it because our lives we just see I keep doing that what are you talking about don't tell me what to do this is how I've always done it, and this is the result I always get I'm not going to be doing the same thing. But when you do it because Jesus put it on your heart to do it, it's all about God's time. When Jesus comes in and he says, this is what we're doing, and you do it because Jesus said, this is what you're doing. When that happens, amazing things that are not a result of your hard work happen. God does amazing miracles. God does the impossible. He brings together things that you could never imagine. I don't know what was happening underneath the water as this is going on, but evidently I imagine some little angel is under the water with, you know, with scuba gear, passing out sardines. Come little fishy, 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 come. I don't know what's happening, but I do know that God always works behind the scenes in preparation for people who are following his way. In in ways that you could never organize yourself, strategize yourself, in ways you could never imagine. God is at work in a multiple ways, multiple layers of ways, making it happen so that when he calls you to do this or do that, it's ready to go and off we go. And that's what God calls us to do. And that happens in the core of a small group in a more, most wonderful and important way. You know, today we, we have this idea that, you know, I've got lots of friends, Facebook friends, you know, and, and I, I, I don't spend as much time as I used to hanging around people. It's not like it used to be. Now we live in a digital world. It's, you got to change. You got to adapt. You got to keep up with the times. Yes, maybe so, but somebody needs to tell our neurobiological brains that now just be content with people knowing about you. <laughs> be, be content. Find satisfaction in, in people just being able to list. This is what you're like. This is what you ate for breakfast. This is where you went on vacation. But there's something inside of our soul that completely resists that and are actually aggravated by it. What we want is not somebody who knows about us, but we want somebody who knows us, who knows our heart, who knows our life, who knows what we're, we're going through right now, who knows the difficulties we're part, dealing with, who knows what makes us so excited, who knows what, what the celebration is to our heart, what it means. You can know everything about me and know nothing about me at the very same time. We do not need to be deceived by the promises of social media that, oh yes, this will be your new group. No, it's just more people that know more about you. It's nobody that knows you. Knowing you is a face-to-face -face event. <laughs> to know you, to understand you. You want to know me? Go look. I, I post, uh, post on Facebook. I post on Twitter. I post on Instagram. I post all over the place. You can read all that. You can know a ton about me. One time I was with some teenagers in our church and, and they got to talking about a me and what they knew about me and it was kind of like mocking me because they knew so much oh he likes to eat here oh he always goes right there he always drinks this type of coffee da, da, da. this is where he went on vacation they knew a ton it was kind of frightening it's like wow how you guys know that much about me? you guys should go work for google this is amazing you guys know so much about me you know so much about me but you don't know me if you want to know me, go talk to somebody who spends face to face time with me go talk to my wife Ami well, I, I kind of hesitate to say that. 
<laughs> After you talk to Ami about me, who really knows, you know, might not want to come talk to me. <laughs> you might never want to come to church again. <laughs> but that's okay. If, if I talk to your wife, I wouldn't want to speak to you either. So <laughs> it kind of all works in, right? It kind of <laughs> comes in there. <laughs> but that's it. It's that face-to-face -face time. It's, it's that getting to know each other. And, that's, and that's, that's what the church has done now since Jesus' time for 2,000 years. And, and we have sometimes a moment of arrogance to say, oh, well, it's about time we change that, you know. No, no. It's about time you change, you know, exercise. about time you change eating. You know, some things are just biologically necessary. Some things are just human. Some things are part of what it is. And breaking up into communities and groups of people that actually know you, that's the human experience. That's what it means to enjoy life in abundance and its fullness is to be with people who really know who you are, who spend time with you, who know your feelings, who know your fears, who know your strengths, who know your weaknesses, who know you, and, and, and they also know the things that, that we need to keep moving on. Because for all of us, we all want to be the very best people we can be during this time frame that we have called a lifespan. Don't let me waste a moment in doing something that's useless. I want to use my moments for the very, very most productive, very most effective, for the very most good. I don't want to be a problem in people's lives. I want to be good in people's lives. I want to bring blessing to people's lives. Help me to do that. Help me to do that. And that's what a small group of friends will come around and they will do. Those are the ones that will help you. 57 times, 57 times in the Bible does the idea of helping one another come up. It's not just helping. There's so many. There's love one another. There is instruct one another. Be kind to one another. There is pray for one another. And there's all these... Uh, Carry each other's burdens. Carry the burdens for one another. And that only happens in face-to-face -face relations. So you can't even really be a Christian outside of a group of friends that you have an intimate relationship with who know you so you can carry out these one another's. It's carry, you have to have that in order to do the things that we as Christians are supposed to be doing. You have to have that intimate relationship, that group, that closeness, that face-to-face. -face. This doesn't happen in any other fear. It's that group. We have to have that in our lives. That's how it happens. That's how God brings this thing about. It's not about going to, to church in that sense, and then that would meet the... No, no. Going to church is great. Coming to worship is what we do as a big crowd. But fellowship, friendship, that's what we do in small groups, in a small space. And it, that is what is required. We do not want to be a church with small groups or the home groups as we call them. We don't want that to be a side. No, we want everybody to be in a small group just like we want everybody to have a vibrant relationship with Jesus. It's necessary for all of us to have that group and so much more, as, as the mayor pointed out, in our city that just seems to, to pretend that that need doesn't exist, who seems oblivious to that or, or offer jokes of a substitute. <laughs> oh, yeah, here, here, have this coffee. You know, it's made with all kinds of really strange sugars I've created in my laboratory. You drink? No, it's not. It's not. It's a substitute. It doesn't know where is the pure cane sugar from Maui. That's what I want. Where get fill that by my coffee. It's that same thing. No, we know what a farce a substitute is, and we know what the real thing is. And groups of people in relationships. So I want to challenge you. I want to challenge each of you here today. Be a part of a small group. We call them home groups because they meet in homes. Take, go, go through that door. I know it's a little bit scary. I know maybe like Peter or Simon, Peter, you'll, you'll walk through it and you'll say, ah, I don't really know that, um, I don't really know that this is really for me because I'm, I'm not like these church people. <laughs> you know, I, I, I did get detentions when I was in school. <laughs> you know, I have done some things I'm not proud of. I, I've even had my name in the paper. I've, and, and you come up with all these reasons why, no, I'm not sure these people could be my friends. But let me remind you, we are human beings. We are all sinful. We have all made many mistakes. We all have a long list of things we regret. That's what it is to be a human being. That's what it is to have a family. And a church is to be a family. And so, you know what? You're a family. And when somebody does something crazy, something that embarrasses, something everybody yells at that person, nonetheless, they're still a member of the family. You're still a part of it. You come together and you remember, I'm a part of the family. Different family members have different levels of maturity, but they're all part of the family. And we all live and we all work and we all bring each other along. 
I would hope that when you would have the courage or the insight or the, or the desire, maybe this is an answer to a prayer in your own life, that you would sign up for one of these groups. Oh, talk about completely life-changing an experience for you to be able to come in and, and to experience that. Because you know what you're going to find in the small group? You're going to find, perhaps, likely, somebody who's in the midst of a bankruptcy. Yeah, somebody who's going bankrupt. What better place to be that if you're going through a bankruptcy to talk to somebody who's in the midst of it or has already gone through it. Where, where better to talk about somebody who's really lived, gone through it, and come out on the other end than in a group like that. You're, you're going to go to a group, and, and somebody in that group is going to have, have dealt with an addiction. Well, who better to talk to than somebody who has dealt with an addiction has come out on the other end and said, this is what it's like. This is what happened in my story. This is what my experience was. You know, maybe you're coming in with, with a history of abuse in your own life, and you come into this group. Inevitably, God's going to hook you up, pair you up with somebody who has experienced that, who knows what you're talking about, who knows what that's like, and they're going to walk you through and says, look, that's where I was. That was a horrible phase, but let me pull you, let me help you, let me guide you to a much better day. This is the path. If I had to over it, this is how I would have done it. And they'll speak words of wisdom and life into you, and you'll be so grateful. That's what happens. You'll be in a group, and perhaps you're coming in because you're still suffering the loss of a child. Well, who better to talk to than somebody who has lost a child? Who better to talk to in that sense? That's what a small group is. We are people that we talk about the reality of life. We don't come in to impress anybody. It's fine if you want to impress me. I, I like being impressed. But the other side is, you know, if you, if you come in to impress, you know, you know, you're just showing everybody your strengths. And, and that's really something. But when you are vulnerable and you are open with your weaknesses, you know what that does? That does something that strength and impression can never do. It shows you as a human being, and human beings are wired, neuro neurobiologically wired to connect. And when you share your struggles and share your weaknesses, you are connecting with people in a way that satisfies your soul. That deep, deep part of your soul, oh, okay, I found what I'm looking for. I found this group. You know, uh, today, psychologists have recently discovered a little a new aspect to it, and they call it mirroring. And it's one of those things that's just so obvious. You wonder where the, the light bulb, it, it really took that long to turn on, you know? <laughs> yeah, it kind of did. <laughs> and it's the idea that a human being really doesn't know himself or herself unless they understand how other people see them. Seeing somebody, seeing yourself from the outside. You know, a small group allows for that. It allows for those opportunities for somebody to say, hey, this is what I see when I see you. Lots of times we'd be afraid. I say, oh, no, no, they're just going to criticize me. But I tell you what, the great majority of those, all those times, you know what they are? They're when you doubt yourself and you lack self-confidence and you don't think you can make it or you just don't have what it takes. You hear a group of people that say, no. You know, I, you said you did this, and I saw you do that, and I've noticed this. You can. No, I know you, and I know what this problem is. I know you can do this. To have somebody else who sees you from the outside, what a great blessing that is. How important that is for our lives. Have somebody that comes around and says, you know what? These are our uh, challenges. These are the things that we're looking to, to support. These are the things we're looking to do better at. You know, I have a group of people like that say, this is God's word. How do I live that out practically? This is what Jesus is calling me to. How exactly does that become reality in my life? How do I behave like that? How do I do that? And, and a group comes together and they share ideas about that. And you're like, oh, wow. Well, maybe that is possible. Maybe we can do this. Maybe we can see this. Let me tell you one of the most wonderful experiences in my life in a small group there. And this happens rather regularly. It's absolutely wonderful. When the people in that small group, they hear what you're going through and they empathize with you and they do the best that they can do. Now, I'm not saying it's, la it's, it's lacking. I'm not saying the best they can do is, well, you did your best. Well, can you? it's not that at all. No, this is the best they can do. The best. They cannot do anything better than this is the thing that makes it happen. And what they do is they gather around you and they pray for you. Amen. And they pray for you. You might be sitting here saying, oh, who cares about that? I don't need that. That's because you haven't had a group of people gather around you and pray for you. And you haven't experienced. What you've experienced is only that which comes from inside. That's what you've experienced. Wait till a group of people pray for you and something comes from the outside. <laughs> Wait till the presence of God comes in and meets that need. Wait till God does something in that moment in your life that you could never have done. Oh yeah, you've lived your life. You've done this. You've done that. I've done this a million times. It's never worked. But let me invite you.
invite you to a moment in your life. Let me invite you to an experience where you walk through a new door. And this time, yes, it's the same thing, but this is the difference. It's not you saying what you're going to do. It's God saying, this is the way. Walk in this way. When you walk that way and you line yourself up with God, wait to see the miracles he's going to do in your life. It's going to look huge compared to the miracle that, that Simon experiences and those nets being so full. That will be what happens in your life. When you connect with what God is doing, when you stop sabotaging God doing his work and you give freedom to God to do his work in your life, that's where the blessing comes in. I hope every single one of you says, you know, I'm going to sign up for a home group. I'm going to get it. I realize coming to church is good, but coming to church is going to church, to belong to church, to belong to church, to find a family that's my own, to find a group of people that care about me and people that actually know me. That's what I'm looking for. You know, people who come to church come and then they go. But people who come and then belong to a church and then they find a family, these are the people that stay. These are the people that God says, look what I have for you. Jesus had a family. He had brothers, sisters. He had his mom he had, in adulthood. He had all that going on. But he went and he found a group of guys, a small group of people, a small group of people. And they came together. And it's the only thing that ever changes the world is when a small group of people come together for a purpose. That's the only thing that's ever changed anything in this world. And that is what will change your life. It will have a dramatic, transformative effect on your life. So be open to that. Be open to what God's doing. We're going to take this moment here. We're going to sing a little bit. And I want to, to remind all of us that this singing is not like a concert. In a concert, you come and you listen. You come and appreciate. This is not. What we do, we give an enormous importance to the words, to the words. I know in pop music, you don't even know what the words are, but you still like the song. No, no, that doesn't work in church. In church, you come, you have to know the words. You have to say those words. Let them become a part of express you like poetry. Let it become an expression of your own heart. And I invite you, just follow along with those words. Sing the words, repeat the words, whatever it be. But let this be a time where God ministers to you and touches your heart and your life. Let God do what he desires to do in your life. Let's stand here at this moment together and let us worship Jesus and let him do what he wants to do in our lives.